I am so excited to be here to talk to you about this topic. Uh, but first, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about my evenings with my son, especially when I tuck him into bed. So every evening when I'm tucking him in, I ask him, did you brush your teeth? And I get a, oh, bruh, why? And then of course, you know, he drags himself to the bathroom to go brush his teeth to do the thing that's good for him, or so I thought. After a while of asking him this over and over and over again, I started wondering, yeah, bruh, why? And I started digging and trying to find answers. Um, and I learned that the dental advice that we get of just brush two minutes twice a day and floss, you'll be healthy, is actually a myth. Because you see, the bacteria that we're actually trying to clean out of our mouths, they're not on our teeth. They're on our tongue, our gums, and our palate. But please keep brushing for other people's sake. <laughs> that said, though, that got me wondering, after 25 years of working in technology, what advice have I been giving out that's been a complete myth? Having strong passwords will keep you protected online. We've heard this over and over and over again, and frankly, it's not actually helpful because the passwords that are actually protecting the information, well, that information is everywhere, on search engines, on you know, our emails, social media, devices, everywhere. So it really doesn't do much, it's superficial. It gives us the false comfort that having a strong password is protecting us online, when in reality, it's not doing much. Now, that's exactly why I'm here today to talk to you about it, about a few things that we need to change. But before I tell you about the changes we need to make, let me tell you about why we need to make them. You see, technology has evolved so quickly. I mean, hardware itself. Remember back in the day when we had computers we had to sit at the desk to use, where now we can walk around with them with literally in the back pocket of our skinny jeans. Software has evolved as well. Software has evolved so quickly that today, artificial intelligence software took a bar exam that lawyers take months just to study and cram and pass. Well, it came in at the top 10%. Isn't that pretty? That's pretty amazing. It blew my mind when I saw it. Now, even more amazing is the amount of data that we create every single day. As a society, we create about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Now, if you know what quintillion bytes even means, well, welcome to the nerd club. <laughs> but if you don't know like I didn't know and I had to look it up, well, it's, let me equate it this way. If you take a grain of sand and it's one byte of data and I collect every grain of sand from all over the world, you'd have three days worth of data. That's a lot of information. I mean, that literally is a plethora. Now, with that much technology advancement and this much information at hand, just for a moment, imagine if this got into the wrong hands. Unfortunately, it already is. Because adults and elderly are getting calls from AI technology mimicking their loved ones and conning them out of money. We also have large companies that are having data breaches every single day where they lose millions and millions of dollars. So it got me wondering, outside of these large data breaches, what really happens? Where do they go? Where do they sell this stuff? How do they make money off of this stuff? And I started digging and digging and digging, and I, understood one thing as I was doing that, is that technology in the right hands had the potential to do tremendous good in this world, and in the wrong hands, unfathomable evil. Last year alone, cyber crimes cost people like you and I, companies and governments, nearly $8.3 trillion. $8.3 trillion. And this year, it's gonna be upwards of $11 trillion. So, I got to wondering, again, where do they make that kind of money? I started reading stories online and I came across one from Facebook where Meta, the parent company of Facebook, reported a data breach of a million user IDs and passwords which were compromised. So then I said, okay, well, a million user IDs, where do they go to sell this stuff? Like, really, come on, there can't really be anything out there, right? And to my shock, or not really shock at this point, there is a menu of pricing available. 
Every piece of data that we generate has a price tag associated to it, and it's sold in the darkest, most nefarious, and rarely traceable place on the internet, called the dark web. I want you to imagine it's something like a haunted house, you know, where we go in October just to scare the crap out of ourselves? Yeah, it's that kind of place where it turned the corner and someone's gonna jump out and scream at you and you practically fall over. Having said that though, I did wanna figure out what does that mean if I ever had my Facebook ID login compromised? So three possibilities popped into my head. The first, nothing happens. Highly delusional, but very possible. Second, things get real, really, really, really unknowing. Where now I have to explain to my friends and family why they got that weird message from me and it wasn't really me, it was a fake me, but then they don't believe me because I'm the resident weirdo of the family. <laughs> and that's a different problem I have to deal with. And then the third possibility, a dire situation, a situation I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And to understand this situation, I need you to kind of take a journey through my twilight zone that happens up here. It starts with something like this. Megs, if they have your Facebook login, they can log in anywhere you use Facebook. Login with Facebook options are usually used for retailers where you have credit card details and then you have bank details. They'll max out your card, they'll empty your bank account, but wait, if they have Facebook, they'll get into your Facebook account. They'll know where you are, where you go, where you live, where you work, who your family is, and who your child is. And at this point, I just have to remind myself to breathe. Just breathe. And then I lie to myself, like most of us do. Don't be silly. This stuff only happens in movies. And then the universe laughs, <laughs> or I should say Google and sends me a very triggering article about a young teenager in Texas named Ariel. Ariel, like most teenagers, is a phenomenal kid. And this story is very triggering, and some things I'm about to share with you are as well. You see, Ariel, like most teenagers, loves social media. She posts online all the time. She's been doing it for years. She gets direct message by so many people. So when a young woman named Ursula reached out to her, she didn't think anything of it. And so what we didn't know, or she didn't know, was Ursula was part of an eight-person sex trafficking ring out of Ohio. She had been monitoring Ariel's activity for months now, so she knew exactly what to say, what to do, and how to do it so that she could convince Ariel to become friends with her. And she did. For months, the girls talked and they got to become friends. And one day when Ariel posted how excited she was to go to a basketball game with her dad, Ar Ursula messaged her right away. I'll be there too. We can finally meet up. This is gonna be great. And the girls decide to meet by the bathroom at the stadium. They both get together. They're having a great time. And Ursula suggests, oh my God, this is so much fun. Can we just like hang out all day? I mean, my friends and I, we're gonna go hang out. Why don't you just get in the car? We'll go, you can text your dad from the car and then I promise I'll drop you off after. Only Ariel never returned to her parents that evening. Ariel's among 27 million people globally who are recruited and human trafficked through social media. 27 million, and a large portion of them are teenagers. That got me wondering, every time I told this story to people, I always got the same question. How could she have just left? She didn't know this person. I mean, come on, common sense, right? And my simple response every single time, she was conditioned. How do I know that she was conditioned? because I have been conditioned before. You see, back in the 80s in India, when I was a little girl, I loved all things Bollywood. I mean, the sparkly dresses and dancing and the music. I mean, I pranced around the house and annoyed the hell out of my mother. And then I loved playing house, you know, with those little teapots and pans and plates and stuff. I loved being alone. I loved it. But don't get me wrong, back then, I was also known as the friendly neighborhood chatterbox. Because by the time I got off the school bus and got home, I knew all the gossip of the street. It was amazing, I mean, what you learn from just a walk. That said, 
My fondest memory was of my dad giving me chocolate Cadbury eclairs every single day. And then I remember the root canals and hence my intimate awareness with oral hygiene. <laughs> that said, everybody that was around me at the time knew these things about me. And that included him. Who is he? He was my neighbor. And he was my abuser. You see, he used all these things he knew about me to condition me into trusting him so that one day when he would ask, I like playing house. Do you want to play with me? I didn't think anything of it. And I went with him, only to be sexually abused for two years. After so many years of being in that situation, I still think back. Back then, he needed to be near me to learn all these things about me. But today, him and Ursula have access to our information readily because we give it to them. One thing I learned as part of this is that while they need the information that we're giving them, the information or the technology isn't good or bad. It's the intention of the user that makes it so. Now, I'm one of the lucky ones because my family moved away from India and we'd end up here in the United States where I was finally free from him. And I'm happy to report that Ariel was brought back home to safety by a nonprofit that used technology, image recognition technology, to find a sex ad for her on the dark web albeit with a long road of healing ahead of her. And I'm also happy to report, by the way, that Ursula and her little band of bandits are behind jail now, thanks to this nonprofit. So again, it's not information or technology which is good or bad. It's the intention of the user because they chose to harm and the nonprofit chose to protect. The one thing that becomes apparent as we look at this is criminals, they study us, they observe us and they bank on our lack of knowledge, our vanity, our greed, and our need for attention to get to us in any meaningful way. The criminals, they study us. And the one thing that's apparent that I wanna make clear here is that neither Ariel nor I are to blame for what happened to us. Now, after years and years of being in technology, a few years ago, I was presented with an opportunity to combine my passion and purpose to protect lives with technology skills that I had acquired for years and years. And I jumped at that chance to form the nonprofit that I run today. And as part of that nonprofit, our mission is to protect lives through technology. Do you remember the Facebook story that I told you about? The one that was a million user IDs that were breached? Well, that didn't happen on the platform. It happened on our devices because we download apps that access information every single day from these devices. Now, for a moment, think about this. Today, on your phone, what's all the information you're carrying? Compromising pictures, maybe, banking account, a lot of information. Now, Again, information, technology, isn't good or bad. It's the intention. And so as part of me forming this nonprofit, I learned something about myself that as a product developer who had been developing these types of apps and products for years and years and years that I already think like my abuser and my criminal does. Because when I design a feature, they design a con. When I launch that feature, I identify the users that will be valued and be able to gain value from that feature where they gain value from that user. When I go and launch that feature, they go and launch the con. When I monitor the feature, they monitor the con and rinse and repeat. So every single time that I get an opportunity to talk to my fellow product developers, I always urge them, it's our ethical responsibility to do the right things for our users and design safety features in because we think like criminals already, we should be thinking of this ahead of time. And as much as I wanna say, oh, we can think of every scenario, we all know that's not possible. Which is why all of us need to make some collective changes. And it's why we are actually launching a new program as part of the nonprofit. 
called the Technology and Online Exploitability Safeguards. And if you picked up on it, the acronym is TOES. Listen, it's, man, it, you know, it's hygiene. I'll be it with a silly name, but it's a program that allows and elevates everybody's knowledge of how to implement safeguards. Because we're always told, do this, do that, but we're never told how to do something. And that's what we're changing. We're working with partners and companies and experts to try to create how-to guides so that people who don't know how to use technology can use it in a safe way going forward. And today, as part of all the things that I've shared with you, I'd like to share five tips that you can take away with you. First, stop using login with options. Those third-party logins, while they may be safe, if one gets compromised, everywhere you use that gets compromised. Use password managers instead. They're far more safer and encrypted to protect your details. Second, use virus protection software in every single device you own because it's no longer just for computers. We grew up in an era we only used it on computers, but now it's available on every device. Use it. Third, always, 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 Always check what apps are requesting access to on your devices. If it's optional, remove it. And if you're not comfortable with giving that access, don't give it. Because those apps that tell us how beautiful we look or how skinny we are or how fast our phone's gonna be, well, they take a lot of information from you because they sell that data to others. That brings me to my fourth point. Clean up your data online. How do you do that? Go to the privacy policies of companies and businesses you no longer do work with. Their privacy policy has an email address, and you can email them, and by law, they're required to remove your data if you request it. But if you don't have the time to do that, because it is pretty cumbersome, hire an identity protection service. They'll request it on your behalf, so you don't have to. And lastly, stop oversharing. Because that little avocado toast that looks so beautiful that you posted on Instagram, I can tell you the ingredients, where you bought them, where you actually ate your avocado toast, how often you eat it, and how I can engage in a dialogue with you about it. So don't share that avocado toast. Maybe just a few pictures here and there are fine. Now, universally, one truth remains forever, is that criminals, they need our information to get to us in any meaningful way. And if it's the information that they need, then it's time for us to make it a little more difficult to get at it. Shall we? Thank you.